will also be facilitating this webinar, and I'll let Marianne go ahead and introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Marianne Hunter. I'm a retired nationally board certified uh, teacher librarian, and I do a little work uh, for C-STEP. Uh, I kind of keep track of legislation, and I've been sending out the uh, weekly newsletters. Great. Thank you, Marianne. So I am also a National Board Certified Teacher, AYAELA, recently renewed. And Marianne and I um, just thought it would be helpful to provide from a teacher's perspective some of the salient pieces from the Every Student Succeeds Act, which gave rise to this webinar. I want to introduce a couple other people on the webinar and then also go over a few logistics about how the evening will flow. And I want to echo Nasway's comment in the chat box that we're tremendously appreciative of your giving up an hour of your Sunday evening um, to, to learn about this. We know what important work lies ahead of you tomorrow and we're glad that you're here with us. So with that, um, Nasway, could you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Good evening, everyone. This is Nasue Nishida, Executive Director for C-STEP. Um, thanks for jumping on. I'm going to be monitoring the chat, uh, which you'll find on my screen. It's on the right-hand side, um, kind of like the fifth thing down, um, that you can start chatting your comments or questions in there. And I'm going to be monitoring that during this, this time, so feel free to do that. Great. Thank you. I also want to introduce Erin Marswick, who's C-STEP's event coordinator and communications person extraordinaire. Erin, would you say hello? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this Sunday evening. And Erin's here. She's our fantastic technical support. She's also going to help me remember to record the webinar. And if places we get stuck, Erin can help us out. And I'd also like to introduce Chris Pearson, who is a principal superintendent here in Washington State and is also serving as a principal ambassador fellow with the U.S. Department of Education. So say hello, Chris. Hi, guys. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for uh, letting me uh, participate in, in the webinar. Great. We're really happy to have Chris um, with us. He's newly returned from D.C., and he will be chiming in and giving us his expertise and perspective as we go along. So um, as Nasway mentioned, your way to communicate with us is through the chat box. Um, we needed to use a platform that had pretty wide bandwidth, and unfortunately the um, opportunity of doing that meant that we couldn't have all of our participants be vocal on the webinar. But we will attend to your questions and needs through the chat. I did want to let you know that we have some information to go through, and we're trying to go through it not too quickly, but quickly enough that we can save time at the end for your questions. Um, if you're like me and you need to put your questions out as you think of them, because otherwise you forget them, feel free to put them in the chat box, and NASWE will monitor that. Um, you can also take notes and ask them at the end. I think that kind of covers that piece. Oh, I, I do want to mention that we are recording this webinar so that we can have the slides and the recording available on our website for folks who weren't able to join us tonight. So before we sort of launch into the meat and potatoes of it, I did want to mention that Marianne and I are both um, in some ways retired from teaching. I just haven't been in the classroom in a little while since I've been with C-STEP. And really we took this through an educator lens. Um, we thought about what would we as teachers want to know about what this new act means for our teaching world. So that's really the lens through which we're delivering the information. Though Marianne and I are pretty knowledgeable people. Um, we are not policy wonks. We don't spend all of our day um, working with policy or reading policy. So that's the perspective that you're getting. And we also want to point out that C-STEP is an independent nonprofit. And to that end, we really see this webinar as an opportunity to share information about the Every Child Succeeds Act. We are not in a position to say whether we think it's a good law or a bad law. We really hope that those are conclusions that you will draw for yourself based on the information that we provide and that you'll find an opportunity to be involved at your local level where you'll find a lot of the important decisions that impact your classroom practice will be made. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. We organized um, the webinar kind of around key questions we had about it. First, we thought it might be helpful to spend a little time talking about what is ESSA and how does it relate to the other alphabet soup of other educational laws that have been out there. What are the big changes? How will it affect Washington? And we'll also invite you during this is to consider how this will affect your practice because we know that's the really important piece where the rubber hits the road. <laughs> 
Whoops. Um, so, to give a little context about the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, this is part of, it's the most recent iteration of what's referred to as ESEA, which is the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. This was part of President Johnson's administration, and it was the really among the first um, piece of legislation that dealt specifically with education. The expectation was that ESEA would be revised every seven years so as to be responsive to the students and the states that it's meant to serve. Sometimes that happens and sometimes that didn't happen. The iteration that you are most familiar with was what is called No Child Left Behind, which was enacted in 2002. So No Child Left Behind really is just uh, those that administration or those senators or representatives stamp on the revised ESEA. They're, they're really one in the same. No Child Left Behind is what we were living with since 2002. It was scheduled for revision in 2007, which clearly did not happen, and eventually passed as Every Student Succeeds Act in 2015. Something interesting to note that also um, helps explain where Washington State sits in all of this. Um, when the Obama administration came into, was elected and came into power, they were concerned about aspects of No Child Left Behind. Their hope was that Congress would take up the reauthorization, and when that didn't happen, they offered waivers from No Child Left Behind. As you know, Washington State did have a waiver, and then we didn't have a waiver. Um, where Washington State is, is currently under the quote-unquote old law of No Child Left Behind until ESSA is fully implemented. Um, but as you will find out in just a minute, even states who received a waiver will be in the same transition position we are in because the limitations of their waiver are ending soon. So, to talk a little bit more about ESSA and what it means on a national level, I'm going to hand it over to Marianne. Okay, thank you. So, um, as you can imagine with legislation of this scope, there are, is a lot of politics involved, and that's one of the reasons, of course, that it took so long to reauthorize. Um, and a lot of uh, civil rights groups had a, had a lot of concerns about No Child Left Behind, and so were very eager to um, keep an eye on uh, the new legislation. So, I pulled a couple of... Um, quotes from a press release that came from the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, and that is a coalition of civil rights groups that, um, there are 37 groups, and these are our big hitters like um, uh, the Urban League, the Children's Defense Fund, the Education Trust, uh, etc. And um, so their press release kind of gives kudos and concerns. They are um, excited about the fact that this is a hugely important civil rights law and that gives an opportunity to um, really meet the needs of disadvantaged children. Um, their concerns have to do more with um, accountability and the fact that the big shift in this is that um, a lot of the power and control is going back to the states and for underserved people um, local control has often been uh, kind of a path to obstruction and so um, in addition to saying their concerns this uh, press release also gave a call to action they're very concerned that stakeholders parents etc get involved as the regulations are written and, and sent out to states that that people have a place at the table and get involved. So let's talk about what the timelines are. Okay, so here's a little calendar. Um, things start to actually happen in July. The changes that are going to happen to um, to the Title I, Title II, et cetera programs are uh, taking place in July. Then in August, this doesn't apply to us so much because we don't have a flexibility waiver, we don't have a waiver, but um, those are terminated and the state's uh, comprehensive plan uh, has to be submitted to the Secretary of Education. And that's a plan that's going to have, is required to have a lot of stakeholders involved. In October of 2016, the changes to the competitive programs will take effect. And we don't exactly know what the programs will look like yet. Um, We'll be waiting for the regulations uh, to tell us more about that. Um, 
And then the next school year, 2016-17 school year, is a transition year when the Secretary of Education will be taking the steps necessary to provide for the uh, orderly transition. And then finally, 2017-18 is when everything kicks in, um, all the changes to accountability and assessment and improvement will take effect then. So um, these are kind of, uh, the big changes are kind of general questions that people have had, and I'll let you read that list. But um, if, we w if we had to say one major overarching change, it's that the um, responsibility goes back to the states. Um, so that's the huge shift. And we're going to be going into more detail about these um, various questions as we go through the presentation. I also want to mention that a lot of these um, questions and, and what we're choosing to focus on tonight come in response to the, the questions and issues you identified in the original SurveyMonkey registration. Um, we're trying to use a large enough grain size um, that we really cover a lot of that, and we recognize that you may have some very specific questions. A lot of those may get answered later on, um, and those that don't, we'll try to compile and find a way to get uh, those questions answered for you. Okay, so um, as Katie said, we kind of organized this around uh, what you in indicated a, an interest in. So each section uh, is listed here, and um, Katie's going to begin with talking about assessment and testing. Everybody's favorite topic. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> um, the existing requirements remain in place. And truly what happens next, which really is the big question that everybody has since we're pretty much almost into testing season for this year as it is, the, the biggest answer to what happens next really depends upon our legislature. And I'll talk more a minute in a minute about why that is. Um, what's the same with No Child Left Behind is we need to continue as a state to assess at least 95% of our students. Another piece that's relatively the same is that um, in language arts and in math, in grades three through eight and once in high school, we will continue to assess 95% of our students. And for science, we need to assess them once in elementary school, once in middle school, and again in high school. So then that would lead most of us to say, well, what test and what grade in high school, because high school covers a couple of grades, and that's where we really get into the states having flexibility to determine that. States are still required to provide assessments for English language learners for English language proficiency. Still, still um, necessary for them to provide alternative assessment for cognitively disabled students, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about special populations. And states are still continued to participate in the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which doesn't affect all students, but affects a sampling of students so that as a nation we can measure growth over time and with other countries. This piece, these pieces are new and are pretty well um, in response to the political climate that exists. Um, states can create their own testing opt-out laws and, and determine what should happen if, if their own schools miss their targets for taking the tests. Districts are also required to have a policy and provide information to parents about the opt-out laws that the state sets. So that's a new piece to pay attention to. In terms of what this means for Washington, um, especially around what tests, what's required for graduation, when are we giving these tests in high school, you'll see a list of bills that Marianne has provided as our, our legislative watchdog. Um, rather <laughs> than go into each of them in detail, which we don't have time to do tonight, do look for her legislative updates. Um, again, we'll also make the PowerPoint available on our website, so if you want to go back and know which House bills or Senate bills to watch, that list is provided there. So moving from assessment and testing, part of the reason that was such a big concern for many of us was what it has to do with accountability. So moving into accountability. Um, first and foremost, it's really helpful to know that there is no AYP. There will still be state-set state measures for improvement, um, which means that our own Office of Student and School Success has a lot of authority to determine plans and acceptable matrix. Um, states devise their own plans, and those will be approved by the Department of Ed, and then you can see when that's effective. As a state, we have to set goals that address testing, English language proficiency, and graduation rates. Um, for our plans, how we move forward, 
For elementary school and middle school, there must be three academic indicators, and those are listed. But here's a new piece that's really um, interesting and will be interesting to watch it play out. They also must include at least one non-academic indicator. And there's some examples that are given there, but any further uh, requirements or regulations have not yet been specified. So that's a pretty big question about how will states and districts, um, what will they use for that non-academic indicator? High school has the same indicators as elementary and middle school in terms of three academic indicators, proficiency on state tests, English language proficiency, and an academic factor that can be broken out by subgroup. In addition to that, um, there is a stipulation that high schools who get below a 67% graduation rate will require intervention. So a couple of key pieces there. What are the non-academic indicators going to look like? Great question. That's something for the states to figure out. The state will set their own measures for improvement and the punishment or reward system that may exist for that as well. At present, there isn't any um, language in the legislature in terms of bill introduced that would um, connect with that, but we will want to keep an eye on OSPI establishing work groups um, to help monitor the progress of subgroups. So that's an opportunity to be involved. One more thing I wanted to say about the subgroups, and it connects back up to what Marianne pointed out about civil rights leaders. Um, Civil rights leaders have been very concerned about the practice in some states of combining subgroups, maybe your um, Latino and Native American population, to count as one super subgroup. Their concern was that that's not giving an accurate picture of how individual students are doing. So it does um, indicate they're hoping through the regulatory process that the Department of Education will enter that they will eliminate the ability for states to use super subgroups and really require reporting out by specific subgroups. The, the thinking is that that may be easier to do now because there aren't punitive measures for how those subgroups are doing at a federal level. That's all determined at a state level. So that's a little bit about accountability. And we'll move into what that means for schools who have maybe in the past suffered from those accountability pieces. Okay. Um, so in terms of the schools that are determined to be low performing, um, the states are, again, going to have a lot of control over designing the interventions that will take place. So uh, districts will be required to report uh, on low, the lowest 5% uh, performing schools once every three years. And then with regard to the um, subgroups, they'll be required to report on uh, them annually. So there's going to be two categories of intervention. There's a targeted intervention and a comprehensive intervention. And in the comprehensive intervention, this, the state determines or the district determines uh, and uses evidence-based um, uh, programs to for interventions. If this district is, or if the subgroup is chronically underperforming, there's an additional thing that needs to be uh, provided in a targeted intervention, and that is uh, identification and description of what the inequities and in resources are. So that's a big change from No Child Left Behind. It's no longer a one-size-fits-all intervention. So more control back to the states. Okay, and I think people also are very eager to learn about what's going to happen with the standards. So, uh, the language for challenging academic standards remains the same as, it, as in uh, the No Child Left Behind. The standards must also continue to provide three levels of proficiency. They have to be aligned with um, entrance requirements for higher ed and also, and this is a big uh, thing that President Obama touted in the signing ceremony, um, they must align with career and technical education standards as well because he's all about college and career readiness. Um, the difference is that the state is not required to submit its standards. They um, in fact, the Secretary of Education is barred from forcing or encouraging or cajoling states to pick a particular set of standards. Our state is not, um, has not typically been real contentious about standards. There is a bill that was introduced last year, last session in the Senate, um, 6030, that uh, 
ask that the state uh, move away from Common Core standards and um, disconnects with the Smarter Balance uh, consortium, assessment consortium. But that bill didn't really move anywhere last session, and I don't think it will happen this session either because they've got bigger fish to fry. Okay. Okay, teachers. We care a lot about teachers. Um, so one of the things that we um, paid careful attention to is the fact that highly qualified is gone. States determine still who is qualified to teach what, and I put that in quotes because that really is dependent upon um, certification and any requirements that a state sets. But we do not have to report out teachers who are teaching a certain number of subject areas out of their certificate as unqualified. So. Um, that could mean some leverage for Washington State and their ability to legislate their way out of the teacher shortage that we are um, incurring right now. So um, the other piece that's good to know is that the, no, the um, no Child Left Behind waiver requirement that connected teacher evaluation to student outcomes has also been eliminated in ESSA. That was something that was just in the waiver. Um, for Washington State, that does mean that our student growth component still is a piece of what we do as part of teacher evaluation because it's a state level, it's a state law, not a federal law. The guideline is that state law can be more restrictive than the federal law. It cannot be looser than the federal law. So even though ESSA does not have any language about teacher evaluation being connected to student outcomes, that doesn't change the practice in Washington State because of our state law um, requires us to have that connection. As you can also see, um, there is some tie, there's the flexibility for using Title II funds to look at teacher evaluation systems and support systems that are connected to student achievement and that also involve multiple measures. Um, another piece that is required in ESSA is that states must describe how low income and minority children in Title I schools are not served at disproportionate rates by ineffective, out of field, or inexperienced teachers. So what that means is that the Department of Ed requires of each state um, a report on e educator equity, which is poring over the data and determining is there a discrepant number of teachers inexperienced or less experienced who are serving high need populations. Um, what they want to see in that data is that there isn't a big difference between the range of experience of teachers working with students who have um, low needs versus those who have high needs. So in our state, um, that report was conducted by an office in OSPI. That report is available on the OSPI website in terms of here's what our data says and here's what we're going to do about it. They took stakeholder input into this plan um, and on our last one of our last slides you'll be able to see a link to that report. So it's talking about how are we as a state going to make sure that all students have access to excellent teachers. Some language to look at, the reason, or some bills to look at are listed below. Part of the reason there are so many in this area has a lot to do with the shortage that we're facing in Washington State more than anything else. But that's a, a list of bills that you might reference if you were um, so inclined in looking at that area. And then next, Marianne's going to talk a bit about special populations. Okay, so again, with um, special populations, it's up to the states to uh, monitor these, and uh, OSPI will be one of the charges to OSPI is that they uh, convene uh, work groups uh, to uh, help with monitoring these different special populations. So for English language learners, um, responsibility or accountability for them moves from Title III to Title I uh, because ELL is um, often linked to poverty, so that will give them more accountability. Um, and ELL test scores, um, unlike with no child, the test scores can, will be phased in over, three year, over the students' uh, first three years in U.S. schools, so that gives a uh, quite a bit of leeway. Um, as far as students in special education go, um, alternative assessments can be given, but only to 1% of the whole student population in a school. So that would equal about 10% of the students in special education will be able to have um, alternative assessments. Um, a couple other things um, that are different is that the um, 
special populations are going to be, um, their performance is going to be uh, uh, measured on a combination of indicators, not just uh, test scores. And also the data that's being disaggregated will also um, account for um, homeless homeless children, foster care children, and children from migrant and uh, military families. Great. Thank you, Marianne. Mm -hmm. So what else is there to, to talk about in terms of what impact it might have in our state and in your classroom? Um, it's important to keep in mind that one of the ways in which one of the functions of the Department of Ed is to interpret the law um, in, through regulations and through funding restrictions or criteria that go out to states. So uh, there were some questions earlier um, in the SurveyMonkey about what does this mean for early learning. And one example of this is how they, who has responsibility for what programs may impact what the implementation of ESSA looks like. For example, the preschool development grant used to be in the Department of Ed. It is now under the U.S. Department of Health Health and Human Services. So um, a lot of these topics are covered through block grants that will go out to states. That includes development of new programs and shifting of other programs. Um, something else to be aware of is that there is a weighted student funding pilot. So there are 50 districts um, across the U.S., none of which are in Washington State, um, but Chris is going to correct me if I'm wrong about that, where um, districts are able to try out a weighted student funding formula combining state, local, and federal funds to better serve low-income students and those with special needs. So it's, it's their way without breaching what states have the ability to control, um, to begin to look at are there other ways, are there ways in which we can rethink funding so that those low-income students and students with special needs get the resources that they need and have reported that they do not have sufficiently. So at this point, I want to invite um, Chris to, to pop in and, and say a few things, to comment on things that we've said or further explain things that we've said, and then from there, we'll move into beginning to answer some of your questions. Thank you. Uh, you know, you've covered uh, covered it all very, very well, I would think. Um, I was recently there uh, at the Department of last month and, and met with, uh, along with uh, uh, about 30 other principals from around the country with senior staff uh, and John King, who's the acting secretary, and uh, they really are um, fully invested in, in continuing to uh, create programs and or incentives to support our underrepresented uh, students and it's still very much a civil rights law for them uh, but they also were very clear that um, a lot of the power for implementing uh, programs is with the states um, and that it's the role potentially of our of principals and of superintendents and teachers and parents to, to make sure that states uh, do this well and continue to support our most underrepresented kids while uh, still working very hard for everyone involved, all stakeholders, all teachers and principals. So it's it's a balancing act. And as I was sitting at the table all day listening to folks talking, um, I wrote, I kept just in, writing down and thinking in my head, well, what is Washington going to do? You know, how are we going to how are we going to do this? And and who's going to be at the table uh, to make some of these decisions? How are they going to be made? And I don't have a great answer to that yet, but I do know that it's important that we're there. Um, I, you know, especially when we start talking about accountability, but also evaluation and um, a lot of the things that have uh, been a part of our conversations for the past several years. So, if nothing else, hopefully we come, you guys, if you come out of this webinar uh, with the notion that we are going to have to speak up if we want this to be done correctly at, at the state level. Great, thank you, Chris. So to Piggyback on what Chris just said, um, most decisions are going to be happening at a state or district level. So it's it's recognizing that um, there are lots of opportunities to speak your truth, vote, um, make your voice known, and pay attention to what it looks like as it moves from a national law to a state law to what you do every day in your classroom. Um, the, there was an open comment period for the department um, to take input on regulations that they are forming that will, again, be how the law is enacted in terms of directives to states. Um, so I believe that comment period closed, and they'll begin working on the regulatory language, which um, then we will be able to see and, and come to states. Look for opportunities to be part of work groups, 
follow legislative activity, know that likely most of the legislative activity around provisions related to ESSA will be in the next session. Um, this is a shorter session, we're coming up on an election, and there's a pretty full plate already, but we already listed some of the bills that you might want to see and pay attention to. Um, let's move into some questions. Um, we have had Naswe monitoring the chat and monitoring some of the questions. I did notice that there was a question that I want to open with around testing um, in terms of do districts have to give the same test? Um, that's a really good question. My, my sense is that that is decided at a state level with the legislation, um, but you know, honestly, that's, that's as much as I know. I don't know if we currently have the provision for different districts to be giving different tests. I believe there has to be a state, common statewide assessment, and that comes out of a state level, um, but I'm going to let my colleagues chime in on that one as well. Yeah, I've, uh, just from conversations at the Department of Ed, I would be surprised, you know, if there was if there wasn't a, uh, a common state test out of this. Um, I do th think that some states like California are piloting different different things, but um, I haven't I haven't heard that being discussed in conversations around testing, for better or for worse. Thank you. Nasue, do you have any questions come up on the chat or do we want to give folks yeah. an opportunity? Okay, great. Yeah, we've got a, a great bunch of people chiming in on chat. So I've kind of clumped some things, folks, um, and hopefully um, th this will get the questions answered. Um, there was a couple of questions about students, and I, and I would say this is probably for more of states that received waivers on, on the current um, no Child Left Behind law around the connection between student scores and teacher evaluation. Is that in ESSA? Good question. So no, it is not in ESSA. Um, however, if states have passed legislation that connects teacher evaluation to student achievement or student growth, then those are still permitted to remain. So just to clarify, if they were, if there was a state that received a federal waiver, which was not Washington State, they did, in order to receive that waiver, need to make a connection about you shall connect um, some student scores with teacher evaluation. Correct. And with the waivers, um, the provisions for any state that had a waiver are ending in August 2016. So even states that had that as a, a provisional piece of their waiver. Um, there is no waiver as of August 2016. If they passed law as a state connecting those two, then they, unless they um, alter that legislation at a state level, that would need to change. Otherwise, um, you live with the law of the state. But there isn't an expectation in the SSA that you're allowed to include teacher evaluation um, as, and student achievement as connected pieces. That's now okay. a, a state level decision. Great. Um, so there was a question around any idea or any specifics in the current law about what the definition of subgroups is? Well, they have identified um, specific subgroups, and I don't know if the states are then also able to um, describe different subgroups than what are already required, but they're you know, they um, do it by race, ethnicity, poverty level, um, uh, special education, um, gender. gender, yes. Um, and a lot of that will come out in the regulatory language from the Department of Ed to states in specifying what is it they have to report um, as a state back to the department. Okay, great. Um, there was also a question about, um, in the standard slide, um, about the quote-unquote states need to create challenging standards. Um, however, those standards actually don't need to be submitted to the federal government for review or anything like that. So would you say in some ways the federal government is saying, yeah, states, you absolutely need to have some kind of standards. We would call them challenging standards. And whatever those are and however you create them, is up to you. Yes, there is an I think that that's is federal, federal correct. oversight beyond just saying you shall have standards, challenging. Correct. Standards. 
Okay. That's my understanding, yes. Yep, that's my understanding as well. That obviously the, the political history behind that is um, the perception was that the department um, was really pushing Common Core and actually that was part of their waiver. Um, this is in direct response to that, saying, um, and even goes so far as to say that the Secretary of Education cannot specifically right. require states to use the Common Core standards. I think it's, it's fair to say that um, the Common Core State Standards and the Next Generation Science Standards would likely fall under that umbrella of challenging, um, but you know beyond that there isn't a whole lot. And just for a point of clarification, I um, just know that that was this, the whole Common Core Standards piece was a point of negotiation when the new law was being worked on. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think this is in some ways a concession to say you shall have challenging standards and if you want to keep your common core next gen you can or if you want to create something else go for it but but in fact that was a concession point between the parties yep and states will have to choose how to act upon that because again many states passed legislation that indicated what their standards were going to be whether they were common core or not so a change in what the standards would be would come at a state level Okay, thank you. And um, just to add a little bit, the law or the bill proposed to uh, detach our our state from um, from Common Core standards. The language in that bill says something about returning to Washington State's already outstanding uh, learning standards. So, um, if if our state does move away, it would go back to the old standards. It sounds like. Okay, good. Um, okay, so questions related to the highly qualified um, information. One question about um, do states develop their own requirements for certification? That was a question. And states do have their own certification requirements. However, eight, you know, back in the day, which is right now, <laughs> um, highly qualified, um, there, there were certain requirements that uh, the feds wanted high, the, the state's highly qualified definition to kind of tick off. And so what that looked like in different states was very different. Um, but our and, our and in some cases our state needed to do some things in order to meet that kind of letter of the federal law. Um, but we will go, we have our own certification process and reciprocity with other states um, to determine that um, certification now that H2, HTQ is no longer. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. The understanding, okay. sort of the reason it was in No Child Left Behind to begin with was the concern that what was a highly qualified teacher or even you know good or great or an acceptable teacher in one state was so different from state to state and that was of concern to the, to the department and Congress at the time. And so that was why the provision for highly qualified was in there. Um, the feedback and the pushback to that is that it really limited some states. And, and I know that in our states, we've heard lots of stories of teachers talking about having to send a letter to their parents saying that they were an unqualified teacher, despite the fact that they had you know, might have even been a national board certified teacher or, um, you know, had been teaching for a number of years. So the attempt to sort of, I don't want to use the word standardize, but have some consistency around what a highly qualified teacher meant um, is gone because that's no longer a provision in ESSA. And as Naswe said, what qualifies a teacher to be teaching in a district uh, in a certain subject to a certain age of students is up to state certification requirements. So do you foresee the changes to the highly qualified teacher uh, provision, aka we won't have that anymore? How do you see that impacting um, our teacher um, shortage issue that's nationwide? Um, I, I would uh, jump in there. Um, one of the things that's being talked a lot uh, about a lot in the legislature around these um, teacher shortage bills is opening up reciprocity between states. Um, so that's, again, that could 
create problems if there's no standard definition of what a holy, highly qualified teacher is. Um, but it's also going to make life much simpler uh, for rural districts who have a really tough time attracting teachers. Um, it's going to give them a lot more flexibility. Okay, good. Um, two two questions. I'm um, we're we're at seven forty, and we've got a whole host of other questions that have come on. Um, so I'm just going to kind of tick through these next two very quickly. There was a question about whether there will be letters continuing to go home about quote unquote the failing school that their child attends. And my understanding is that when NCLB ends, that will exist no longer. Is that correct? I That's believe so. Understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other question was on, um, it was called out as student support programs, but I think Cindy meant supplemental services, which was basically a district had to provide um, tutoring or after school kinds of programs for students to receive supplemental support. Um, and that was a requirement and came really out of the district's own coffers to do that. Um, my understanding is that money will also, that provision will also go away and districts will not need to provide those supplemental services? Right, the set aside Correct. for, yeah, yeah, that's my understanding is that that's tied to no child left behind and then that also goes away. Okay. Yeah. And that, when we got, when Washington temporarily had a waiver, that 20, we got that 20% back and it comes out of your Title I funds. So for a little while we got that money back and then when they took the waiver uh, away we had to go back to the SES plan. So that was part of No Child Left Behind, that won't be a part of anything moving forward. So Chris, will that money just be now assumed back into Title I? Correct, so that was okay. your Title I grant and so mm -hmm. you had to set aside that 20% but uh, so you'll no longer have to set aside the 20%. Okay, good. And Chris, a, a question for you. Um, what do you feel is the best way principals can position themselves to respond to this new law? as building leaders or so, district leaders? Um, great question. I think there's, a, there's one thing that's really important for principals um, and that is uh, in previous iterations of this law, uh, for a while it was the language was just really teachers and then they added teachers and principals uh, and this time around there's actually some su separate categories and talk of uh, teacher leaders and principals uh, and there's some actual resources tied to uh, professional development for principals, retention, uh, and recruitment of principals. So this potential, there's potential for this to be a really good thing for school leaders. Um, uh, AWSP is a leading advocate for us, and they're really uh, they work at the same table as as, uh, as CSTEP and and uh, WA in a lot of cases, as long, as well as with superintendents. So. I would, as a principal, I would start communicating with uh, my representative at AWSP or one of the state uh, leaders at AWSP to see how uh, how I can get involved. Okay, good. Um, so there, there is a several questions that have come up in the chat about um, the big A. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> The scarlet letter. No, I'm just joking. Okay. <laughs> and this is being recorded. Great. Um, anyway, so there, there are a couple of questions on this. One is, if, if an implementation plan by the state needs to be submitted at the end of summer, the legislature needs to do something this session? Or how would, do we have any idea how that would look? Pretty much we, with assessments right now um, and, and what's in place, that can continue to move forward. Changes to what we're doing right now would need to come up through bills and make its way through the legislative session um, for it to change what we're doing. There's a significant transition period that's provided by the department to begin implementing ESSA. With, which is in response to the notion that states can't change what they're doing on a dime. There's processes and procedures that have to be followed. So with no change, we don't do anything differently until um, state legislation tells us that we need to do something different. So my suggestion, folks, is you, um, we will send this PowerPoint out to you and there's a, a host of bills in the legislature being proposed right now um, that you should definitely dig into and look at. Um, so we'll get you this PowerPoint and you can look up those bills because um, 
that this is where the change is going to happen that would be implemented for the 16-17 school year. So you'll want to, if you're concerned about that issue, um, you should definitely be looking into that. Um, so Katie, just to clarify around highly qualified. When highly qualified goes away, there will be no requirements for schools to meet that even if you are a Title I school? There may be requirements in reporting the data, but getting the label back um, and there being you know, punitive sanctions won't exist. So what states will have to report will still come back um, through the regulatory process. Um, the state is also keeping data on this because of their own educator equity plan. But the piece where we get labeled, that, that goes away. Okay, and a good reminder to everybody, regardless of whether highly qualified is there or not, our state has its own certification requirements and you do need to meet those in order to teach. <laughs> so um, if you are not familiar with, with, with what those are, and they are different depending on when you enter the profession in our state um, and, and kind of what certificate level you're at right now, um, you should head to the Professional Educator Standards Board, Board's website to find out more information. Um, about certification um, requirements and changes. They are the body that um, has the authority to approve um, different policy issues related to that. And I also, as a public service announcement, would say that any national board certified <laughs> teacher, recent or not recent, should also make sure they're clear on how their national board certification interacts with their state certification, their license to teach, so that you keep up on both requirements. Good. I like that. Um, so one, one other question is, there, there are some opportunities in this law for teacher leadership. Actually, nobody listed this question. I'm just going to ask it. Um, there are some opportunities in this law around teacher leadership. What, what would you say those are in this new ESSA? Well, I think... I the, think go ahead, Marianne. Well, I think the... Um, What's obvious now is the uh, the work groups that are going to be convened through OSPI will be a good opportunity for teachers to um, be at the table. Now, what exactly those um, work groups are going to involve or be responsible for, I'm not totally clear at this point. The other piece I would say is that um, we, we reference this in our next slide as we list kind of resources and references. There's an excellent blog piece by um, Maddie Fennell, who is a former Teacher of the Year from Nebraska, Nebraska and a former um, Teaching Ambassador Fellow. She was really part of the heart and soul behind the department's Teach to Lead initiative. And she does a really nice job outlining, far better than I could, how teacher leaders, how there may be more opportunities for teacher leadership under ESSA than there were before. A lot of it just goes back to the flexibility. Um, the challenge with the flexibility around funding that states get is that means that the states or even districts have the ability to take this pot of money and carve it up how they want to because that's not being regulated by the Department of Ed or by the law. So there are lots of opportunities, but you need to know where that money can come from and who it is that gets to decide how that money is spent because the same pot of money that could pay for teacher leadership initiatives could also go to pay for other things. And I, I think just to note, as as we hear about what those opportunities are for, for teachers to engage in work groups, um, we will try to advertise those opportunities to you all. So if you're on our listserv, you're going to probably hear about that first. Um, it, it, but it is, at this point, unclear how OSPI is going to proceed with this. So that's partly why we can't really give you a, a hard and fast answer on that. But we, we will keep our nose to the ground and um, let you know as soon as we know. Um, one good one actually this is an interesting question any impact on class size that's related um, to ESSA that would be at a state level that wouldn't that I am aware of come from um, anything in ESSA but Chris and Marianne you want to check me on that um, I would agree with you that that's still going to be an issue at the state level but Chris probably has a better idea of that no, you guys are, are right. Um, I mean, just in terms of what really what we're talking about here in terms of money is Title I money um, and 
the, the flow through is it comes from the feds to the state, then to the to the LEA or the local district. So in terms of teacher leadership and uh, impact of that re of those resources and funding, there is an opportunity at the district level to lead, um, and to, um, there's a lot of choices at the district level for those resources around PD and all those kinds of things. Unfortunately, those can't necessarily go to class size, uh, but they potentially could go to support staffing and different things like that that might impact your class size or impact support for kids in your class. So, you know, it's really about that title, one, that federal, those federal dollars that come into your school, um, not the state funding that is a McCleary and all the things that are being hashed out at the at the state level. So keep that in mind too. It's relative to that those federal dollars. Yeah, and and Michaela Miller, who's on the line, also posted in the in the question a, a good statement, which is exactly what Chris said. Title II dollars can be used um, to for staffing that ultimately leads to a reduced class size. So you may actually see staff in your schools, or or you as an educator may have a part of your um, salary being paid from that Title II funding source. And in effect, it could be used to actually ultimately reduce class size. Um, so that is one way that that, uh, that funding could be utilized. But, but it's more indirect around staffing, as Chris said, versus saying, you know, we're, we're hiring 10 teachers to reduce class size. Um, Okay, there, there was also, I think this is what Michael meant um, in his question, he was asking about funding, um, federal, I, if, I think federal funding for education, and I just um, did a quick look up about, so just to let this, just let folks know, it, federal funding for education is very small, um, I think it's less than 7% of the federal budget goes towards education, so education really is a state responsibility. Um, and I think in our state, one thing that we have to lean on is our um, constitution, which says that we need to make um, education a paramount duty of the state. Um, but otherwise, the federal government, you know, kind of got into the business around the equity issue um, way back when, but it is very much a small part of the entire federal budget, and it's in the discretionary spending side of the budget, um, so it can it can fluctuate, um, and and that's kind of an interesting piece. We we tend to think it's a lot of dollars, which, on a large scale of a nation, is it's a lot of money, but when you parse it out among 50 states, um, you know it's much smaller than that. Um, okay, other questions in here. Um, if you haven't checked the chat, Katie put something in there about assessment questions. There were some questions about um, interim assessments, requirements, or state level um, for graduation. Um, so just, just know that, again, we highly suggest you delve into those bills that are before the legislature right now around assessment. Those are probably going to be um, much more informative to you about where changes in assessment may be going than this ESSA bill is, or this ESSA law is going to stipulate. And uh, if, if um, our contact information is at the is in the final slide, so if any of you have specific questions about a bill that you'd like me to uh, work on or try to find an answer to, let me know. Yep, so um, this might be a good time for us to begin to wrap up because we know that you all have very busy days to prepare for tomorrow. Um, a couple of resources, and again, we will make this PowerPoint available um, so that you'll be able to find the links. Um, the department's website is a great resource to sort of find out what their timelines are for the regulatory process, find out when there's opportunities for um, comment, and also just to see um, their explanation of ESSA and what it means to them. Ed Week did an excellent um, comprehensive inside ESSA issue, um, and it goes much, much deeper than we could in an hour about specific facets of each part of the law. Um, it does do a, a nice job pointing out um, pros and cons and different political um, 
views of different aspects of the law. So that's a really comprehensive resource to, to access. WA has resources as well um, about their thoughts about ESSA and the things that we need to look for. Um, there's also um, an opportunity um, through your locals to be involved and to make sure your voice is heard and to get training on how to do that. Our um, CSTEP runs a blog um, by National Board Certified Teachers from Washington State called Stories from Schools. We have um, a range of, of teachers in terms of experience and where they teach and what grade level they teach, and quite a few posts have been written about ESSA and the implications they see for their work, so that's an excellent resource as well. Um, the Ed Week blog that I referenced by Maddie Fennell um, that talks about how ESSA might help advance teacher leadership, there's a link to that as well. And the Washington State's Plan for Educator Equity, um, which you can access through that link or at the OSPI website. Lastly, please consider us resources as well. Um, again, um, this is Katie Taylor and I work for CSTEP. I'm a National Board Certified Teacher, Mary Ann, who is doing work with CSTEP through the legislative session, and Chris Pearson, our very own Principal Ambassador Fellow from Washington State. So with all of that, um, keep checking our website. We will do our best to get the PowerPoint and recording up as soon as we can. Tremendously appreciative of your time commitment, not just to this webinar, but to knowing about these issues as you move forward in doing the important work that you do. So we're very grateful for your time and very grateful for your interest. Thank you for your incredibly thoughtful questions, and thank you for what you're doing um, for all students in Washington State.